What kind of songs do planets sing? Neptune! Hey. Okay, so I can't dance. Thanks for tuning in to the Stemulus, guys. I'm Steph Evans, and I would like to welcome you to this very special episode of This Week in STEM, or the last two weeks in STEM, or, you know, whatever. But it's nothing but space news! Over the last few weeks, there's been a ton of really outstanding space news, so I felt like I had to dedicate an entire video just to that in order to cover everything. So let's strap into your space suits, let's get this show on the road. Our first story that we deals with a star that doesn't play by the rules and is just straight up nasty. No, we're not talking about Justin Bieber, we're talking about a legitimate ball of burning gas out in the universe. But the nasty part is no joke. The star shown here is named Nasty One, or Nasty One as its catalog as shown right here. Our dear friend Nasty is a wolf rayet star that was discovered about 50 years ago and is located about 3,000 light years away. So what exactly is a wolf rayet star? Wolf rayet stars are typically large, rapidly evolving stellar bodies that are formed by shedding their outer hydrogen layer and exposing their super hot, super bright helium burning cores. Stars like these are well on their way to becoming supernovas. So what exactly makes Nasty One so special? Recently, researchers decided to take a look at Nasty One through everybody's favorite space telescope, Hubble. What they expected to see was the usual twin lobes of gas flowing from opposite directions, but they were greeted with something very different. Instead, Nasty One appears to have a 2 trillion mile wide space pancake, which is now officially my favorite phrase ever, of stellar dust orbiting around the star. One potential explanation is that an unseen companion star is devouring Nasty One so voraciously that it's spewing its stellar guts all over the place. Who's the Nasty One now? It sounds like this unseen companion star could really use some cosmic table manners, a lot like that one cousin that you sat by at Thanksgiving five years ago. It's not fun sitting in the splash zone. As Nasty One has evolved, it is likely swollen up, which has loosened up the outer hydrogen layer, making it more susceptible to this gravitational stripping. Now there is a different theory that exists about the formation of wolf rayet stars. It involves super strong stellar winds huffing and puffing and blowing off the outer hydrogen layer and exposing the helium core this way. However, this theory has been losing some traction lately. Nathan Smith, a researcher over at the University of Arizona in Tucson, explains it this way. We're finding that it is hard to form all the wolf rayet stars we observe by the traditional wind mechanism because mass loss isn't as strong as we used to think. Mass exchange in binary systems seems to be vital to account for wolf rayet stars and the supernovae they make, and catching binary stars in their short-lived phase will help us understand this process. Ah uh, yes, another mystery of the universe being solved, but there's still plenty more left to investigate, and Caltech and MIT are working together to do just that. By combining their super smarts for good and not evil, thank god, Caltech and MIT are working together to upgrade the Laser Gravitational Wave Observatories, or LIGO, in the hopes that it will increase their chances of detecting gravitational waves for the first time ever. So what exactly are gravitational waves? Our good buddy Albert Einstein first predicted the existence of gravitational waves back in 1916 as a result of his theory of general relativity. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time that are caused by very violent events in the universe such as supernovas. Gravitational waves are emitted by accelerating masses, much in the same way that radio waves are emitted by accelerating charges. While gravitational waves have never been directly detected, it's widely accepted that they exist based on research such as that done by Joseph Taylor and Russell Hulse. In 1993, those two gentlemen won a Nobel Prize for measuring the impact of gravitational wave emissions on a binary star system. Their measurements were very close to their predictions, which is exactly what every scientist loves to hear. So how exactly do you go about detecting something that has never been detected? LIGO consists of two 4 km long L-shaped interferometers, one located in Hamburg and one located in Louisiana. Vacuum tubes are located inside the interferometer, in which a laser beam is split into two beams that travel along the lengths of the L. While the laser beams are traveling along the lengths of the tube, they're bouncing off super carefully positioned mirrors that are very, very sensitive. The mirrors are positioned at the vertex of the L and at either end of the legs. According to Einstein's theory, when a gravitational wave passes by, it will alter the path of the laser ever so slightly, and this is exactly what the researchers are looking for as evidence of the gravitational waves. So how much does the laser's path have to change? Almost not at all. In fact, before the upgrade, LIGO was able to detect if the laser's path altered by as much as 1 1,000th of a proton diameter. Let that sink in for a minute. Now with the upgrades, it will be 10 times more sensitive. Think about how minuscule that is. Now the dedication for the upgraded observatory has already taken place, but scientific measurements won't start until this fall. 
So good luck researchers, we salute you. Moving on to a story that will have Sheldon Cooper wanting to revive fun with flags for just one more episode, Swedish university student Oscar Pernafelt has designed a flag that will represent all of Earth on future space missions. New thing that I learned this week, there is a scientific study of flags and it's called vexillology. Say that five times fast. The more you know. So let's discuss some of the characteristics of this international flag of Earth shown here. First of all, its dimensions have a 2 to 3 ratio, which is the most commonly used ratio among country's flags. It displays seven white rings, which are presumed to represent the continents, and a field of blue for the ocean. Now here's where the science comes in. That blue was very carefully chosen. This particular blue was selected so that it would stand out well on an astronaut's spacesuit or against the black of the universe. While no space agencies have come forward to officially say that they will use the flag in the future, Oscar isn't too worried. He stated that the flag was designed to remind all people that we all share planet Earth, regardless of our nationality. Feels. Our next story deals with everybody's favorite topic, launches. No, not lunches, launches, like with rockets. You're clearly hungry, go grab a Snickers or something, come back. Pause the video, we'll still be here. Last week, the light sail spacecraft designed by Bill Nye, yes, that Bill Nye, and the Planetary Society took to the skies by way of an Atlas V rocket launched from Cape Canaveral. LightSail will be testing a new type of propulsion called solar sailing. Using a 32 meter piece of reflective material that is thinner than a human hair, the spacecraft will capture solar radiation pressure and use it to literally sail along, much in the way a sailboat does with the wind. If this method can be proven, it will have immediate applications in the space industry, specifically when it comes to CubeSats. For those of you unfamiliar with a CubeSat, they are a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter tiny cube spacecraft that is very cheap to make and very customizable. But the size of these tiny satellites also provides some limitations, especially when it comes to propulsion. It's very difficult to house an entire propulsion system inside that little tiny cube. Using light sail rather than having to try and fit a propulsion system inside of these would be a phenomenal idea and leave room for more instruments or components. However, light sail has hit a bit of a snag. Due to a software glitch, it's unable to communicate with Earth right now. Remote resets have been unsuccessful and a manual reset isn't really feasible since nobody's up there to push the button. Never fear, space enthusiasts, there is one final hope, and it's called a natural reboot. A natural reboot occurs when enough stray charged particles strike the spacecraft, forcing the system to reboot. Help us, Cosmic Rays! You're our only hope! Man, I cannot go one video without making a Star Wars reference, but you know what? I regret nothing! So keep your fingers and toes crossed for Bill Nye and the Planetary Society in the hopes that this natural reboot will occur and they can continue gathering data. Our final story of the week is the one that I am most excited about. This week, NASA announced the nine scientific instruments that will be housed on the spacecraft that is visiting Europa, Jupiter's moon, in the 2020s. Now, it's important to note that this is not the first time that we visited the Jovian moon. Back in the 1990s, the Galileo spacecraft completed 11 flybys of Europa. While Galileo only imaged about 10% of Europa's surface, it still provided enough evidence to convince scientists that Europa may be hiding a massive saltwater ocean underneath its icy crust. So just how massive is this ocean? Scientists estimate that this ocean could have two times more water than what we have here on Earth. Yeah, that's a lot of H2O. If these oceans have a high enough temperature and salinity, then it could be a place where we could find, wait for it, life in our solar system. I'm sorry, did the folks in the back not get this? Life in our solar system. There may be life in our solar system. Life in our solar system. <laughs> life in our solar system. If you cannot fathom how amazing that is, then please get off of my planet, or at least my channel, because that is just incredible! As could be expected, these findings were too juicy for scientists to not investigate further, especially when our good friend Hubble started noticing what appears to be plumes of water ejecting from Europa's surface. Now we still have a long way to go, the mission itself is only in its planning phases, but the basic concept consists of a solar-powered spacecraft that will insert itself into a long, looping orbit around Jupiter. This orbit will allow the spacecraft to perform 45 flybys of Europa over about a three-year period, so a flyby about every two to three weeks. The flyby ranges will be as close as 16 miles and as far away as 1,700 miles. With more than four times the flybys of the Galileo mission, we're going to be able to image so much more of the surface. And now even more pieces of the puzzle are falling into place as the nine instruments were announced this week, and they include the following. Cameras, because duh. Spectrometers to determine surface composition. Radar to penetrate Europa's icy crust to look for lakes hiding below the surface. Magnetometers to help scientists measure the direction and the magnitude of the magnetic field, which will help them determine the depth and the salinity of the oceans hiding beneath the crust. Thermal instruments to look for evidence of recent eruptions, which might have led to those plumes that Hubble observed. 
And finally, instrumentation to look for water and particles in the thin atmosphere that may have been ejected by those water plumes. Using these instruments, scientists may be able to determine the chemical makeup of the environment and determine whether or not it's habitable without ever having to set foot on Europa. After seeing the Europa report, I think that that is definitely the best course of action. So how exactly will we know if we find life? Well, it won't be easy. There won't be any aliens staring back at us from the surface of Europa or any monstrous bones sticking out of the icy crust. Also, none of the instruments that we talked about are put on the spacecraft specifically with the purpose to look for life, just signs that it may exist. And that's the other problem. There is no consensus in the scientific community about what exactly is a definitive sign of life. So while we may find some really, really good indicators, it still may be a little bit before we confirm if we're alone in the solar system or not. Either way, this mission could be a great stepping stone for a future lander mission. You can't land on it if you don't know what it's made of. And our solar system is becoming a more interesting and potentially crowded place every day. So that's it for nothing but space news, guys. Shout out to all my space tweets. I hope you really enjoyed it. If you're all about that space or science in general, feel free to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm putting out videos every Saturday to talk about the latest and greatest in STEM news. Also, if you want to look into any of the stories that I covered today a little bit more in depth, I will include links to those in the description down below, along with links to all of my other social media, so you can check me out on my Instagram and Tumblr and all those other fun places. Don't forget, if you find any really cool STEM news stories throughout the week, feel free to tweet them at me at, at stepfez43 on Twitter using the hashtag twistem, and they just might wind up in next week's episode. But with that, I hope you guys are all having a wonderful weekend, and I will see you next time. one appears to have a two trillion I just spit everywhere. Oh well, nobody's there, so no, no judgment. Nathan Smith. Smith. Shoot. Sorry Nathan. Person I don't know. Cute thing. Our good buddy Albert Einstein first predict predicted say the word predict get yeah, predicted. Did I just make up a word? That might have happened. As a result of his theory of general rev relativity. Oh my gosh. Sorry Al. Sorry Albert. As a result of his theory of general rel relativity. Oh my god. Ah, no, we're not gonna do this right now. Back in 1916, as a result of his theory of general relativity. Didn't quite stick it. Didn't quite stick the landing. Judges give it an 8 out of 10. It's gonna do better. Did I get it? Try one more time just to be sure. <gasps> well, grab a tail here in my mouth. Well. Uh, so this is the knot. This is the knot. It still provided enough evidence to convince scientists that Europa might fail. This orbit will allow the spacecraft to perform. Perform! You are not performing.